Okay, so I'll start. Thank you, Nicola, and thank you for the invitation. So today I'll talk about uh, gigahertz and subterrahertz magnetics using either ferromagnetic insulator or antiferromagnetic insulator. I'll start with ferromagnetic insulator because at the moment they are more useful than antiferromagnetic insulator, but uh, antiferromagnets are quite interesting as we have seen from the talk of uh, Matthias previously. So I will just start with a quick reminder about magnetics if you are not familiar with it. So in magnetic materials, you can always excite the ferromagnetic resonance that will correspond to all the spins that oscillate in phase at the eigenfrequency of the system. But you can also excite uh, propagating excitation that are called spin wave, uh, where all the spin oscillate with a small dephasing between them. And you can characterize those waves by their frequency and by their wavelengths. And so then you can play with those waves in order to uh, perform uh, wave-based computing or also signal processing. And so this is something that has been studied for quite some time uh, now. It started really uh, about uh, 50 uh, years ago, and I will come back to that a little bit later. And the advantages of uh, manionic, why do we try to study those waves and why we try to manipulate them and integrate them in some devices? It's related to the fact that typically their frequency will be uh, from 0.1 gigahertz, 100 gigahertz in ferromagnetic materials and up to the terahertz in antiferromagnets. And a few advantages are related to the fact that you can tune their frequency with magnetic field or using electrical currents. And two other key advantages are related to the fact that the wavelength of those spin wave is generally from 10 nanometer to 10 micrometer. So you have a much shorter wavelength at gigahertz frequency compared to what you would get in a standard uh, metallic cable, electrical cable. One other advantage is related to the fact uh, that uh, the group velocity is much, small, uh, much smaller, so it's of the order of 100 to one kilometer per second. And uh, if you consider a magnetic insulator, you won't have any jewelitting in those materials. So those are a few reasons for which people have been trying to use a spin wave to develop a uh, magnetic device. So as I said, it started really uh, in the 70s, maybe even in the 60s. And uh, he, uh, they are already used uh, in some uh, spectrum analyzer or vector network analyzer where you use this type of uh, magnetic uh, uh, technologies. Uh, but uh, let's say that it stopped quite a bit uh, in the 90s because of uh, digitalization where people st stopped a little bit to uh, develop analog devices. And because of the fact that it was quite difficult to scale down uh, those devices to uh, make a thin film with uh, those uh, magnetic materials. And it was also quite difficult to manipulate them. But it changed quite a lot um, in the last, uh, let's say, 10 years, where people started to uh, show uh, that it's really doable uh, to make those, uh, those materials in really thin films. So there were really big progress in the uh, material growth of uh, these uh, magnetic materials. And at the same time, people started to realize that we can also manipulate the magnetization dynamics using electrical current or electric field or optic uh, excitation. And then uh, we started to see really a lot of subfield uh, related to magnetic where uh, people have been trying to uh, uh, develop new type of magnetic devices. So today I'll talk about only uh, a few of them. I will just uh, start by uh, showing an example of uh, analog magnetic, uh, because this is where it uh, all started. And then uh, discuss a little bit why also people now think that we can uh, use those magnetic devices in order to uh, uh, potentially uh, create some hybrid quantum devices. And finally, I will discuss antiferromagnetic magnetics. Uh, so as I said, people started in the 70s. So if you are really interested uh, in what has been done during this period, and a lot of us uh, really forgot about uh, what has been done there, but it's quite uh, important to come back to that. Uh, people were already doing in the 70s some um, magnetic delay line where you make some type of transducer. And if you are familiar with acoustic wave, you will see that the design are really, really similar and trying to develop uh, some uh, magnetic delay line uh, where you can get a delay of a few hundred nanoseconds on a distance of uh, 100 micrometer at seven gigahertz with a bandwidth of 20 uh, megahertz. So people were already able to do that uh, at that time, but it was quite difficult to optimize those devices because of uh, uh, the nano fabrication process, because of uh, also the quality of uh, the thin films, and because of the fact it's quite, it was quite difficult to simulate uh, those devices. So, I would say that this is something we started again, especially uh, in Thales, people were interested into that, uh, where we uh, wanted, and I will just show you that as an example of a magnetic delay line, just as a use case and show you what is typically the type of measurement that people do when uh, they look at magnetic devices. I will show you what 
we have been trying to do in order to develop manionic amplifiers, which is a key issue if you want to really make circuits that are based on manionic devices. And, and then I will just uh, discuss a little bit quantum phenomena uh, based on manionic devices. So this is what I will discuss in terms of gigahertz manionics. Uh, so why people wanted to make a manionic delay line? So if you want to make a delay line and if you just want to use uh, standard cables, generally you will have to make uh, really big devices because if you want to get a, de a delay of one nanosecond with just a cable, you need about 30 centimeters uh, at a frequency of one gigahertz. So this is why generally those devices are really big. And so there is a need in order to miniaturize this type of devices. So one technology that you can use is uh, acoustic wave. And this has been uh, already uh, developed quite a lot. But uh, one limitation generally of uh, acoustic wave delay line is related to the fact it's difficult to go uh, higher in frequency than four to five uh, gigahertz. But this is typically a radio technology that you could potentially use uh, when you want to uh, work at frequency lower than five gigahertz. So the advantage of uh, magnetic materials is that you can go higher in frequency. Um, and as I was saying, so you use again similar type of, uh, of uh, structure as I show you. So you use one transducer is in order to convert the signal from an electrical signal into a spin wave. Then the spin wave will propagate and you can detect it back with a subunit transducer. And generally in order to uh, characterize those devices, you use vector network analyzer where you measure the interstitial losses, the uh, reflected uh, signal and the transmitted signal uh, with this uh, the type of instrument. So when, then if you want to make a device, so either you use a EV lithography, but it's also quite easy to do it with uh, optical lithography for this type of uh, standard uh, devices. And so this is something that uh, we have been doing uh, uh, in, uh, in the past. And for example, what you can get in terms of delay line with uh, this uh, manionic uh, technology at the moment is uh, a frequency that you can tune from uh, one to 15 gigahertz by applying extended magnetic field. You can get a bandwidth of 100 to 150 megahertz with insertion losses that are about uh, 10 to uh, 15 uh, dB uh, at the moment with a delay of 15 uh, nanoseconds. So there is really, uh, I would say, in terms of uh, the closest application, uh, some effort in that direction to develop uh, analog devices based on uh, uh, um, um, analog mac uh, microwave delay line based on manionic uh, technologies. Then if you want to go a bit further and integrate uh, various functionality uh, on chip, uh, one uh, thing that is uh, really missing is a way to uh, avoid the fact that the spin well will decay from the point where you uh, inject it and then to be able to amplify it. So one way to do that is, for example, to use a spinal effect that uh, was discussed by Matthias in the talk before, but also by Aurelien yesterday, where you inject a charge current in an heavy metal layer that is on top of your uh, ferromagnetic materials. And with that, you can potentially amplify your signal in some configuration. And this is something that we have been doing uh, quite recently uh, in the PhD of uh, Hugo uh, uh, Merbouch, uh, where we have seen that uh, if we apply sufficiently large current in the right direction with some uh, trick in terms of uh, current pulses that you apply, uh, we can get this type of spin wave amplification, which is quite important uh, if you want to be able uh, to cascade uh, manionic devices without having to transduce back your signal into an electrical signal uh, and uh, have some uh, other amplification. So at the moment in magnetics, I would say that people are first trying to develop functionality like dephasing, filters, oscillators, or delay line. And then if you are able to have some amplification effect, you can try to target as something that is a bit more ambitious is then uh, to uh, at reach uh, the level system, uh, for example, and then to uh, do some, for example, spectrum analysis uh, with magnetic devices, logic gate that have been developed uh, uh, in the past and potentially also uh, do some neuromorphic computing. And there have been some recent works uh, from the group of uh, Catherine Fulsize uh, uh, last year. Um, so that will be the conclusion of the first part. Now I will just really show you why people think that we can also use a spin wave in order to uh, uh, develop some hybrid quantum devices. And just to highlight uh, what can be the quantum properties of uh, spin wave. Because when we talked about spin wave, we can always describe them by their wavelengths or by their frequency. But we can also describe them uh, as magnums, which is a quasi particle that is associated to a spin wave. And those magnums are bosons with a spin of plus one. Um, they carry angular momentum, and it was also discussed in the talk of Matthias uh, before. And in magnetic insulator, the lifetimes of those magnums can be larger than the thermalization time. Uh, 
of uh, the magnons, which means that you, if you can increase the magnon population up to a threshold uh, level, potentially those magnons can condensate into uh, magnon boson chain channels. So the idea would be, uh, and this can be achieved at room temperature because of the small mass of the magnons. And the idea will be really the following. So if you just go back to a standard uh, uh, Bosenstein statistic, the key idea in order to reach uh, Bosenstein condensate is to be able to increase the chemical potential to the minimum in energy of uh, your dispersion curve. And in order to do that, what people have been done, uh, have been doing uh, 15 years ago, was to excite the magnum, magnums through microwave pumping. They increase the magnum population. And at the threshold level, they were able to observe magnum condensate. So just to show you uh, how it uh, works, so the people were using Brillouin light scattering, where you can detect uh, the magnum population in K space. So maybe a bit small to see here, but you can see that initially when you pump uh, your magnetic system, you see that you have a broad distribution of magnums in the K space. And then if you wait a little bit for uh, the magnum to interact between them, you see that the magnum population is evolving as a function of time. And after about, uh, uh, 700 nanoseconds, you see that you have this magnum magnum interaction and you reach at the end uh, the boson chain condensate where all the magnums uh, have the same k vector and the same frequency in k space. So, this is how people were able to show that you can uh, reach a magnum boson chain condensate. And this was done by microwave pumping. So, what we have been uh, trying to do uh, in the recent years was to show that this is also doable by using spin orbit torque where we use electrical current in order to generate magnums. As Matthias said before, if you put, a, uh, if you put current in an NG metal, you can uh, generate some bias in the, at the interface that will increase the magnum population. And if you reach a threshold level, you will see that the chemical potential is then stable. And you see that the population of magnums at the bottom of your spectra is increasing uh, drastically, which corresponds to a boson chain condensate. So this is just to show you that depending on the experiment that we are doing, we can also highlight uh, the quantum behavior of uh, magnons uh, in this type of uh, nanostructures, and not only using for a standard analog uh, microwave devices. So that was the conclusion uh, to my first part. And then I will discuss uh, a little bit more why uh, we are trying to uh, integrate uh, antifluoromagnetic materials into uh, magnetic devices. And I will show you uh, what we have been doing in order to detect uh, coherent uh, gigahertz antiferromagnetic magnons, gigahertz because it was a bit easier for us to do gigahertz measurements. Uh, and so to have a DC um, detection by inverse spinal effect, I will come back to that, of the antiferromagnetic resonance and more recently of propagating spin wave. And then finally, I will discuss uh, the fact that we can also uh, detect, uh, detect uh, terahertz magnons. And this is a paper that will come out soon uh, in Nature Communication. Uh, so I will not discuss uh, so much in detail uh, why it's interesting uh, to, uh, to study antiferromagnetic metals because yeah, it was done uh, perfectly by Matthias uh, before. I will just highlight a few things why we are able to do gigahertz magnetics and terahertz magnetics with antiferromagnets. This is related to the fact that the frequency of your antiferromagnets, so generally it's quite large because of the exchange field, and this is why it's in the terahertz range. But as Matthias was saying, we also have this anisotropy field. And in some material, it's so small that at the end, the frequency can, can also be in the gigahertz range. So it's quite easy with those materials to do proof of concept of uh, magnetic devices with antiferromagnets. And then if you just increase it a little bit, you will uh, be in the terahertz range. Um, so what I will discuss quite a lot uh, in the next part of my talk are spin pumping effect, inverse spinal effect, so I will just uh, explain it really quickly. The key idea is that you excite the magnetization dynamics of a ferromagnet or an antiferromagnet. So then the spin will all process in phase or when you are propagating in phase, they will travel. And then this uh, magnetization uh, dynamic can generate a spin current if you put an heavy metal layer, for example, on top. And this spin current in the heavy metal can be converted into a charge current that you can then detect with a nanovoltmeter, for example, or with a standard uh, voltmeter. So you can do electrical detection of the magnetization dynamics uh, through the inverse spinal effect. You can detect two components, uh, either uh, the DC one or the alternating one. And I will discuss those two terms a little bit later. And the key question that we had and that we still have, I would say, is uh, what can be the amplitude of this electrical signal that we can uh, detect in the case of an antiferromagnet? 
because inductive detection is quite difficult to do with an antifluoromagnet because you have a compensated antifluoromagnetic order, sometimes a small counting, but generally the inductive signal that you can detect is extremely small. So this is why we are trying uh, to detect the magnetization dynamics more looking at this uh, inverse Kinole. Uh, so what people had been doing in this uh, really two nice papers that were published uh, now three years ago, was to detect this inverse pinhole signal when you excite the antiferromagnetic resonance of an antiferromagnet. So they were applying really high magnetic field and generated uh, uh, frequency at a few hundred gigahertz. And this is a type of curve that they could uh, detect uh, with a nanovolt meter when they were uh, applying a magnetic field that correspond to the antiferromagnetic resonance. They could detect some peak in voltage that correspond to this uh, inverse pinhole effect uh, of your antiferromagnet. But the signal were extremely small, about a few nanovolts. And uh, they use the best compound in order to do this type of measurement. And this is due to the fact that this inverse spinal effect will be proportional in uh, easy axis antiferromagnet to the anisotropic field of the action field. And as we said, the action field is extremely large. So this effect is also quite small uh, in this type of compound. So what we tried to do uh, a bit more recently, and Mathias uh, showed uh, some of the results I won't uh, uh, spend too much time on that, but was related to the fact that in continent magnet where you have the, this schemora interaction, in this case, the inverse spinal effect will be proportional to the DMI field of the exchange field. And you can also uh, try to enhance the amplitude of those effects to this, this type of uh, continent magnet. Uh, as I said, if we play with a metal where the anisotropy is small, we can decrease the frequency uh, up to 10 gigahertz. And this is what we have been doing in the case of hematite above the marine transition. And we see uh, this type of curve. So when we apply negative field, we see a positive uh, inverse spinal effect. And uh, for positive one, an opposite uh, sign, which correspond, uh, which is, let's say, typical of the inverse spinal effect. And the effect in this case, again, about uh, tens of nanovolts, which is uh, not so efficient, but that was the first result we could get. And if you compare with the standard ferromagnet, the frequency in this case was about 10 times larger. Uh, a magnetization that is about 50 times smaller than a uh, dispheric magnet. And this inverse spinal effect is only 10 times smaller, which means that we can increase a little bit the frequency. We lose a bit in efficiency, even though the magnetization is uh, even smaller. So these were the first results we could get. And what we did uh, a bit more recently was to look not only at the antiferromagnetic resonance where all the spin oscillated in phase, but to look also at propagating spin wave in the antiferromagnet and to try to detect that uh, coherently. So for that, we use a vector network analyzer and we use basically the same antennas as the one we were de uh, depositing on ferromagnetic materials. And this is a type of curve that we could get. So the frequency is low because it's uh, this continent ferromagnet with a small anisotropy. And we, what was quite interesting and surprising for us is the fact that so if we apply a field in one direction or in another, we could see some anisotropy of uh, the sp uh, spin wave that were propagating, which was a bit unexpected in an antiferromagnet because generally the anisotropy is coming, coming from the dipolar effect. But in this case, because of the small quantum moment due to DMI, we see this anisotropic uh, behavior. And the interesting thing here is that the spin wave velocity um, is about 10 kilometers per second, can be even uh, 30 kilometers per second, which is 100 times larger than what you would get in the case of a ferromagnet. And this is due to the fact that the exchange field is extremely large in the case of an antiferromagnet. Uh, so then, as I was saying, we wanted to see, can we, because those signals were extremely small, uh, small I put arbitrary unit because I think it's, uh, if I'm uh, really uh, honest, it's maybe less than a pico Henry if you are familiar with those uh, type of units. Uh, and then, so if we try to detect them uh, using inverse spinal effect, so you put a heavy metal layer on top, and in this case, you detect uh, the DC signal. So as we were doing for the antiferromagnetic resonance, but in this case, we try to detect a propagating wave. And what was quite interesting is that if you look at the amplitude of this signal here, in this case, instead of being in nanovolt now, it's more uh, uh, nearly in the microvolt uh, range, which is in, of the same order what you would get with the ferromagnet, but the frequency is about 10 times larger and the magnetization is much weaker which means that really what we call the spin mixing conduction that corresponds to how efficient the spin can uh, cross the interface between your magnetic metal and your heavy metal. It's quite efficient, this process, in the case of an antiferromagnet. So we really hope 
And then by scaling up the frequency and doing similar type of measurement at 100 of gigahertz, we could reach also uh, output signal in the micro volt range uh, that would be extremely useful in order to develop uh, anti uh, manually devices. But so, um, if I conclude until now, all the detection uh, we have been doing of magnetization dynamics in the anti net was by looking at DC signal that correspond to uh, the signal signature of the anti dynamics. So in the last part of my talk, I will just discuss how we can also detect really directly the dynamics of the anti magnet. So the AC signal, uh, the AC inverse spinal signal of your anti magnets. So for that, what we have been doing is uh, to excite a B layer of the anti magnet nickel oxide with an heavy metal on top with a femtosecond laser and see if we can excite the magnetization dynamics with a femtosecond laser and if we can detect then this magnetization dynamics. Uh, so for that, so the idea was to shine this femtosecond laser pulses on your anti magnetic system and see if you can uh, generate some magnetization dynamics. And if this is the case, this will generate a spin current in the heavy metal that can then generate some carrier electric field that you can potentially detect by electro optic uh, sampling. So you will use terrier CDS for that. Uh, so when we did that uh, in a thin film of uh, nickel oxide, uh, the thickness was about 10 nanometer. We were quite surprised, but happily surprised, I would say, uh, to see that uh, we can detect uh, terahertz signal with two contributions. The first one is correspond to a broadband contribution that corresponds to some uncoherent magnum that we excite between 0.3 terahertz and uh, 3 terahertz. And on top of that, we really see that we have coherent oscillation at 1.1 terahertz that correspond to the anti mode of nickel oxide. So we can really detect uh, anti dynamics dynamite in the terahertz range in the case of the thin films, which was not done uh, previously. So then the question we really initially we had was, can we really correlate this signal with the anti order? Uh, how can we really excite these dynamics with uh, femtosecond laser pulses? So for that, what uh, we did was, for example, to rotate uh, the sample and see uh, what is uh, the direction of uh, the emission that uh, we generate. And what we could see is that if we reverse the sample what 180 degrees, uh, we reverse the sign of the signal. And we see some unilateral direction uh, for the emitted signal. And we could correlate that by the fact that in those thin films that are of extremely high quality, uh, we have only a single monodomain. And this is something that is quite important in the case of an anti net. It's generally difficult to have large anti domain, domains, which means that if you have multiple domains in all different directions, then you will just average out the signal uh, that uh, you expect to detect. So you need to have large domains in order to potentially uh, detect this kind of uh, terahertz oscillation. So it's at the same time a small signal that you want to detect, uh, but in order to be able to have this type of signal, you need to optimize the growth. And in order to optimize the growth, you need to be able to do this type of measurement. So there is really, uh, you need strong collaboration between uh, material scientists and people that are doing this type of measurement in order to develop uh, uh, this type of uh, new systems, uh, I would say. Um, so really we could say that the third spin current excitation was linked to the anti formatic order, that is also called the NEL order. Uh, and then the question really we, that we had was, how are we able to excite magnetization dynamics of the anti magnet when we shine femtosecond laser pulses uh, on them. So for that, uh, we started a collaboration uh, with the group of, uh, ah, no, I forgot that. Um, before we started the collaboration, we just tried to play with the linear firm polarization. Uh, and we could see that there was uh, some, uh, no effect of the linear firm polarization. There was also no effect if, when we were changing from linear to circular polarization. So we really thought, okay, this effect seems to be a thermal effect and it's not really related to optical effect because we see no effect of uh, the laser polarization. So then in order to understand uh, what could be the origin of this thermal effect, we wanted to see, okay, if this is a thermal effect, probably there can be a response of the lattice. And so we started this collaboration with a group of Matthias Bargier in Potsdam, where they can do ultra-fast uh, X-ray diffraction. And they, can, they could look in those thin films uh, at the position of the nickel atoms when we shine femtosecond laser pulses uh, on the B layer. And what we, they could see was quite interesting. So this is the initial sta state, and they look at the out-of-plane strain uh, of the nickel, uh, nickel atoms. 
And so what happens is that when you send your femtosecond laser pulse, the platinum will expand in less than a picosecond, which means that the nickel oxide is already compressed in less than one picosecond. And then the nickel oxide uh, layer will uh, respond by expanding in, again, less than one picosecond. So you have some type of coherent acoustic wave that uh, you generate in your system in less than one picosecond, which means that you can use this coherent acoustic wave in order to excite the magnetization dynamics because as Matthias was saying before, in those materials, the magnetostrictive coefficient is extremely high. So as soon as you start to perturbate the lattice, potentially you can also uh, excite the magnetization dynamic of your system. So this is uh, uh, what uh, we could conclude from the study. Uh, must point out that as soon as you have a propagation of phonons, uh, both coherent and incoherent phonons, you can have different type of uh, mechanism that excite your magnetization dynamic. The magnetostrictive one, uh, is one of the excitation uh, that uh, uh, one of the mechanisms that can explain this type of uh, signal. But you have also other effects that are quite important to consider. The fact that you generate some temperature imbalance at the interface between your metal and your insulator, and that can lead to spin feedback effect that I will not discuss today. And you can also that can also lead to anisotropy uh, uh, changes um, in your magnetic materials. And all those three effects at the same time will. Uh, allow you to uh, generate this uh, magnetization dynamics uh, in the tire stage. So this is, uh, okay, so then yeah, I just, we did some modeling and it fits uh, quite well. This was done in collaboration with Olemena uh, Gomenai. And I will just conclude my talk here by uh, just saying again that at the moment there is quite some important effort in order to develop gigahertz manionics uh, for uh, wave-based processing or for uh, let's say beyond CMOS computing, but one key issue is really uh, the efficiency of the transducer and the, uh, the problem of uh, spin wave amplification. And this is what people are looking at at the moment uh, because quantum is also uh, an interesting topic at the moment. People also try to see if we can uh, play with the quantum behaviors of uh, magnons. And at the same time, so a lot of studies is done in order to increase uh, the frequency of uh, manually devices from gigahertz to terahertz using antiferometric materials. And I thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Omar, for uh, uh, your very interesting talk, as always. Um, questions in the audience? Uh, I thought you had one, but just now. Oh, ah, over there. Ah. Stefano. Thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. Since you work at a very large frequency regime, I ask you if in this, in this region of frequency, you can observe some inertial effects of the spin dynamics. Because in particular, in slide 26, if you can find it, you have shown two uh, resonance frequencies with 26. Yes, exactly, exactly. In the terahertz region, there are two resonance frequencies and these, uh, these two frequencies are very similar to what has been observed in ferromagnetic materials, where the first frequency is the classical resonance frequencies, the ferromagnetic resonance frequencies, and the second one is the nutation frequencies induced by the inertial dynamics of the spins. I don't know if uh, this can be interpreted in this. Uh... To be honest, I don't really know. This is something we we want to investigate. Uh, we will look at that. The problem is that in those measurements, the detector we were using was cutting at uh, 2.5 terahertz. So we did not look so much at the signal at 2 terahertz. Uh, but yes, definitely, yeah, this is an interesting topic uh, quite with a lot of debate and uh, that, uh, yeah, we will uh, look at that, I guess, in the future. Uh, thank you for this uh, for this talk, Roman, and thank you for the previous question. I have a follow-up question. Uh, thanks God there is a slide in. Uh, so 
typically here uh, you have quite broad resonances and you would expect that Gilbert damping in these materials to be rather low. So can you comment a little bit on the lifetime of, of, of this uh, magnonic mode? So what de determines uh, the damping time here, please? There were so many people involved in the different studies uh, I've been showing uh, today. Uh, and then uh, I think I have a slide on that. I just want to yeah, recall that indeed the damping is small uh, in antiferromagnet and it's in insulating antiferromagnet, uh, what we have seen is that it can be even smaller than uh, in standard ferromagnets. But uh, at the same time, uh, if you just look at the LLG equation, the line width, and then generally the lifetime will be more related to the line width than to the damping, is enhanced also by the exchange field. So even though you have an extremely small uh, damping, the line width and the quality factor of your system is not as good as in ferromagnets because it's always ex uh, enhanced by the exchange field. So this is uh, one uh, big uh, difference between a ferromagnet and antiferromagnets. And then, even though the lifetime then will be a few hundred nanoseconds, uh, so it can be similar to the ferromagnetic case, some generally a little bit smaller, uh, but maybe three, three to five in the bed system. Then you gain again for many unique devices because the group velocity is much larger, so at least they propagate faster. So you have more, uh, it's, you, uh, they can propagate over also long distances, even though the lifetime is smaller. So I think this is how we can explain that both in ferromagnetic insulator and in antiferromagnetic insulator, we can propagate spin wave over micrometer distances. In one case, the lifetime is a little bit smaller, but the group velocity is larger, and then both of them uh, will lead to more or less similar, similar values. Other questions uh, in the in the chat, maybe in the no. Chat, no sorry, but, uh, I have a question. Um, uh, out of curiosity, I, I, I've seen you present uh, these results so many times, uh, so I won't bother you with questions about the last thing. But uh, I never saw the, the the work on the the very very classical things, and I really like old things. So the delay lines and the the amplifiers. Uh, there was one thing I was. Uh, uh, N not quite understanding. So, uh, what, what, when you try to amplify the magnetic signal in the delay line by uh, inverse pinhole effect, uh, how do you keep a phase coherency? I mean, you maybe I don't didn't quite get it because you are injecting spins, but what guarantees that they are arriving coherently with the propagating wave? Cases you have a magnon magnon interaction and uh, then you lose the phase coherence. Uh, the basic idea is generally that, um, yeah, first, yeah, <laughs> no, no, it works, it works, and it's also done in BLS, so you have some phase coherence, but you can also detect spin wave that don't have any phase coherence. Huh? That doesn't, it's not because you amplify that you keep the phase coherence, you can have a propagating signal and lose the phase coherence and they still propagate. Um, and generally, uh, with a spin orbit torque, you will. I mean, first, the first question is which mode do you excite by spin orbit torque? Because you can excite the propagating one, but you can also excite modes that are higher in energy uh, and that are not the mode that you want to amplify. And this is uh, the first issue that uh, people have been facing is that they wanted to amplify the propagating wave, and at the end, they were also creating magnons at higher frequencies. Um, and if you can just excite uh, the low frequency magnum that you are trying to excite, generally you keep the phase coherence also because you, you have some uh, selectivity of the spin orbit torque. Uh. Uh, a question about the, the magnum, the, the antiferromagnetic um, detection, DC detection. Um, uh, so you were showing that. Um, uh, you're getting up to um, ice uh, inverse pinhole effect levels uh, comparable to what you can get with ferromagnets. But um, uh, I was just wondering how much uh, uh, RF power did you need to inject uh, <laughs> to get to the same? Is it taking into account the same, same amount of RF power also? So what would be the sensitivity of the... Ah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> need to exchange. Well, what would be the uh, of the for sure, at the moment with ferromagnets, 
uh, what is the most efficient way to detect is still inductive way, not inverse spinal effect. This is why for manic devices at the moment, we don't use uh, inverse spinal effect for, I mean, at least uh, not at the moment. Uh, because the efficiency is about, if I remember well, about one v millivolt per watt. This is what you, you get, both in ferromagnet and anti-ferromagnet. Uh, 